Alright, so we're up to key issue 4 now in chapter 11. We're going to look why are location factors changing. So basically, why do we see industries moving? We start taking a look at the United States in this section, and we start seeing that a lot of industries were in the Northeast, and they started moving to the South and West. So the question is why? Why were these industries leaving the Northeast moving? Well, one reason is better infrastructure. Because of better infrastructure, like rail lines being built in post-Civil War era in the early 1900s, and better roads, the population starts moving. Because the population starts moving and there's better infrastructure, we start seeing industry move because of those reasons. And we start seeing it move to the south and the west. Another reason is something called right to work. See, up north, unions are very pro prominent and they have a lot of power. And in a lot of businesses, you have to belong to the union to be able to work there. You don't have a choice. If you don't want to belong to the union, you don't work for them in that company. Well, a lot of southern states and western states pass laws called right to work. And what that means is you have a right to work at that business without having to join a union. And what we find is in the south and the west, unions have very little power. Because of that, the pay is a lot lower. So a lot of businesses are attracted to that because they're not having to meet the standards of unions and they're able to pay a lot less. This is really evident in the textile trade because the textile trade sees lower wages. Because of that, it moves out of the Northeast where it was really dominant in places like New York and Boston and starts moving to places like Appalachia, the Piedmont area, and these Ozark area. So that's where we start to see it. And we really see a lot of these textile uh, factories start moving into the Carolinas, Georgia, and Alabama as well. North America is not the only place we saw industry move around. We also see it happen in Europe. Traditionally, Northwest Europe is where most of the industry was, but we see a lot of this industry moving to Eastern Europe and Southern Europe. The EU created kind of like two districts in Europe. They call them convergence regions. And one of them is the competitive and employment region, and that's where we see in Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, because they pay lower wages. We're talking about places like Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, then in Eastern Europe and in Southern Europe, we start seeing places like Spain and Greece start to get some of this uh, industry. And again, it's because it pays lower wages. Now, this is more attractive to businesses because Latin America would be a lot cheaper for some of this stuff to be built. However, the labor in Europe is a little bit more skilled and it's closer to the market. Now, another one of these convergent regions that the EU created was a traditional core area. And these are areas like England and Germany, places that lost some of this industry because of the cheaper labor. And what the EU is trying to do is re, like reboom these areas, bring some of the industry back, much like in America where we're trying to reindustrialize places like Pittsburgh, Cleveland, and Detroit. So we talked about industry moving it around in North America, moving around in Europe, but we're also seeing an international shift. There are different areas that are really starting to attract a lot of this industry. East Asia is the one that probably usually comes to mind. China, South Korea, and Japan bringing in a lot of industry that used to be in Europe and North America. Now, one of the newer players in this is South Korea. They really want to point that out. South Korea is now becoming a very big producer of steel. They also are a huge producer of cargo ships. And they also are starting to really move into the market of cars. China is a big steel producer along with just making tons of other things. And Japan is very well known for its manufacturing. South Asia, especially India, is becoming a big industrial area. Now, India is really focusing in on textiles. And it's really becoming a center point in southern um, Asia of a focal point of business. In fact, by 2050, India's GDP could very well match the United States. Another international shift we see is Latin America. We see this especially in Mexico and Brazil. Now, Mexico has something called Macleodoras. Macleodoras are basically businesses in Mexico that don't pay tariffs to move stuff back to America. So, for example, Ford Motor Company is an example of somebody who uses a Macleodora. So, Cars are made in Mexico, they're allowed to be called American made, and then they get moved back to America because of the cheaper labor. That car does not pay a tariff. See, anything that's imported into a country pays a tax or a tariff. But because these are special areas called Macleodoras, 
They don't have to. The idea is that a lot less Mexicans will try to come into America. It will also boom their economy, making it less desirable to move people into, uh, to have people move into America. Another country that has really had economic booms is Brazil. And Brazil's tried to move up and develop a lot more industry there. In fact, there's something called the BRIC countries. Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Those four countries have an alliance or an agreement, economic agreement together to try to boom each other, to become more competitive with the MDCs. So we're seeing this industrial shift occur. East Asia, South Asia, and Latin America are areas where we see a lot of industry growing in. All right, so now we're gonna take a look at why is this industry moving? What's changing it? Well, the two biggest industries that have been affected is the steel industry and the clothing industry. So let's take a look at the steel industry. North America and Europe were very, very well known for their steel. Places in America like Pittsburgh, thus why the football team's called the Steelers. Cleveland, Youngstown, areas throughout Pennsylvania and Ohio were very well known for making steel. In Europe, Great Britain and Germany, highly known for their steel production. But things have changed so much that China now produces 38% of the world's steel. That's more than all the MDCs combined. So we definitely see the change in the market there. Textile manufacturing is another example. Even though a lot of textile manufacturing moved to the southeast, it has now moved overseas. American workers expect about $10 to $15 an hour plus benefits. In Europe, it's $30 an hour. But in Asia, in Latin America, it's a dollar an hour. And this is why we really see this shift in textiles. Now, something else that's discussed in this section is outsourcing. Outsourcing plays into the new international division of labor. Outsourcing is when you're producing a product, but you don't produce all of it. Cars are a great example. A Ford is not 100% American made. The electronics in the Ford are coming from China. The engine may come from Germany. So what we see is that parts of the vehicle are outsourced, meaning you're having somebody else make a component of that. This is what we call the new international division of labor. What that means is that different parts of the world are being known for things. So cheap electronics is known for China. Steel may be known for South Korea or China, whereas America might be known for the programming of something, the designing of something, and the assembly of something. So we're starting to see different parts of the world being known for producing things. That's why it's called the New International Division of Labor. The labor is being divided up throughout the world. And um, we really see this with cars and computers the most. All right, so right now it sounds kind of bleak. All these industries are leaving MDCs, but we have to look at it a little bit differently. What we see is that a lot of these businesses that are leaving, these industries leaving, are a little bit of the lower paying jobs. The textile industries don't pay a lot of money. What we do find is that MDCs are keeping the high tech jobs, programming, designing, advertising, marketing, those stay in MDCs. So while we may not be building the computer, we're marketing it and we're programming it. Also what we're seeing is that sometimes industry do, does move back to MDCs. Sometimes people learn that you do have to work for less money and also transportation costs ends up happening. As transportation costs go up, businesses have to make a decision that are they really saving money by having a lower wage worker make something or can they build it in that home country to save the money on transportation costs. So those are some factors that bring businesses back or prevent or keep businesses in MDCs. All right, to wrap up the key issue, we're gonna now talk about Fortis versus post Fortis. Now Fortis is uh, identified with Henry Ford. It's in reference to the assembly line. The idea that everything is made in a factory for that car, for example. Everything is made in that factory. And you work on an assembly line and your job every day is to put a door on that car. That's it, that's what your job is. You're the door putter on her. So that's what you're always doing. But what we find is that somebody kind of gets tired of doing that. And it's not always the best way to stimulate somebody to do a good job. So we've moved a little bit more to a post Fortis society. Now the first part about post Fortis is not everything's made in the warehouse anymore, or the factory or the industry. That a lot of things are outsourced and brought in. The next part about it is that you work in teams, you rotate. So instead of doing the door all the time, 
You might put a bumper on or you might do other labor and you rotate around. That way you appreciate what each person has to do and you may take more pride in doing it. Uh, another thing that Post Ford is focused on is leveling. Traditionally, managers might have their own lunchroom versus the normal labor worker. A lot of managers may never have done the job of a normal worker. Well, what Post Fortis tries to do is that everybody works together, everybody eats together. They want management to appreciate what the common worker does as well and identify it with. That way you get more morale and people have more knowledge of the job itself. The final thing that's talked about in this chapter is something called just-in-time delivery. What that means is that we have changed our society. Because we can transport things so much quicker and more effectively, warehouses don't keep a lot of inventory. The best example is a car repair place. When you go to take your car in, let's say it needs a new starter, that mechanic probably does not have a starter for every kind of car out there. That would be a waste of money in inventory because maybe somebody in a Volvo never comes in with a starter problem. What we find is that we have warehouses in major metropolitan areas like, like Orlando, for example, or Miami, or Atlanta, or any other big city. And what this means is that when a mechanic needs a part, they call that warehouse. So let's say they need a starter for your car. They call. Within an hour or so, that part is delivered. So they can take off the problem part. Within an hour, that part's delivered, and they install it. Basically, somebody has paid all day to, in a van or a pickup truck to drive around delivering these parts. That way that mechanic doesn't lose money in inventory that may never be needed. It makes a whole lot more sense. Industries do this with spare parts. They don't keep a lot of spare parts around because they know that within an hour or two a part can be delivered. That saves a lot of money in the long run and doesn't have them wasting their money in inventory they may never need.